Welcome to Breaking Barriers, where we delve into the realms of health and performance. I'm your host, Neil Bester, and in each episode, we embark on a journey of conversation with diverse individuals in the health and performance space. From experts pushing the boundaries of science to everyday athletes sharing their inspiring stories. Join me as we explore the keys to unlocking your full potential. Okay, action. Three, two, (laughs) one, ready. Yeah. Okay, hey guys, this is episode two of my podcast. Looking forward to this one. This is a really exciting guest. As always, everyone is exciting coming on here. Today I'm joined by a really good friend. Basically every single day for the last two years, my 5am client, his story is insane. Welcome sugar, we'll get into that. I typed him in on Google, came out with a really cool written piece, which I'm just gonna read out. He can correct me on anything, he probably typed this, and then we'll get stuck into it. So Shukio Okimani, co-founder, former technical director of award-winning African studio Nyamakop. During his tenure at Nyamakop, Sugar, alongside fellow co-founder Ben Myers, built the studio into one of the most promising studios in African game development, and described as described by Polygon. Sugar was named as one of Forbes 30 Under 30 in 2018 for his work building Yamakorp. Yamakorp released their debut title Semblance in 2018. Semblance was the first African RP on Nintendo ever. Before Yamakorp, Sugar created Boxer. Boxer won the inaugural AMA's Johannesburg Award in 2015. He's also a public speaker, having spoken at various events around the world, including GDC, AMA's, Berlin, and Respawn. I think that sets the, the picture quite clear. Welcome, bro. Thanks, thanks. You have done some stuff, eh? Bro, literally. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was reading that and I was like, this is the dude I see every single day at 5 a.m. Yeah, yeah. Tell me, bro, we're going to get straight into it. Sugar. How did that name come about? Getting right into it. Straight into it, bro. (laughs) All right. So when I first moved to South Africa, I moved to Kingswood College in the Eastern Cape. And my name's tough, right? It's Shukia, all of you listening and watching. But every time I would say, people would always get it wrong. And if you look at how it's spelled, it's like C-U-K-I-A. It's not even close to what it sounds like. So how this name came about, I was on the bench, first basketball game of the year. And I was talking to one of my teammates and I was like, he's like, hey, you're new here, aren't you? I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. What's your name? He's like, Shukia. He's like, what? Shukia. And then he's like, sugar? And I'm like, yeah, we'll go with that. We'll go with sugar. And that's how it's been ever since. And I think it's a very interesting name to call a guy, obviously. So you've had a lot of people be like, I can't call a guy sugar. I'm like, it's up to you. Bro, that's uh, what I put out there. That's Exactly, exactly. I think the big thing for me as well with my name is because it's very difficult to pronounce. I, ref- I prefer people call me sugar than try and butcher my name. That's the worst feeling. And then someone just coming to you and saying your name wrong. It's just, I hate it. Just call me sugar and then don't fight it. Yeah, just take that, it as it comes. <laughs> that's the, exactly. If you put it in out there, that's what you feel comfortable. So literally take it, take it as it comes. To set the scene and context, obviously every single morning we in the gym, sugar's my 5am training partner, client, one of my good friends. Bro, you were telling me actually at Sugar's wedding last year, there was a point that this would have never been possible. You tell the story better, so please like let the the viewers, the listeners. Okay. So I used to train a lot, you know, growing up, coming through high school, even varsity was at peak performance like 2013. And when you leave varsity and all those like structured environments, it, you kind of also lose a bit of discipline. Can I, I just think. interject quickly? For those of you that are going to be listening and not viewing, Sugar showed me a picture when he started training. <laughs> and I was like, bro, you should be training me. You are a hench and shredded. Sorry. sorry. Yeah, exactly. And that, that was the thing. It's like t- 2013 happens. And then leave Varsity. And life happens, right? You're like, 
I'm trying to gun for my goals, career, all these kind of things. So Jim kind of just started slowly going to the wayside, you know, that, that kind of afterthought. And I'm pretty sure most people know that feeling, right? And because I always trained with part, like my friends, it was easy to have like a sense of accountability. But as soon as I was out of varsity, there was no one to hold me accountable. So like my trainer would go up and down, up and down. I sign up for the gym, not really go. And you're like, why am I spending all this money? And so at some point, I, I just kind of felt like I need to explore this. Like there was a gym close by, I think it was just up the road here. And I'm like, let me go check out. It was calisthenics. It looks all cool on the internet. So I'm like, let me go check it out. So I go in. The guy who owns it, remind me his name? Nick. 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 So I go to Nick. I'm like, hey, Nick. So can I start training? He's like, I'm out of here. <laughs> I'm splitting. I'm done. So I'm like, all right, cool. But you see that guy in the corner there? And I'm seeing Neil kind of pack up some shit. And I swear. But it no, I swear. Bro, this is, yeah. Um, so he's packing up some stuff. I'm like, all right, cool. I'm like, hey, Neil, um, he gives me his number. I'm like, cool. And he's like, yeah, I'm busy moving to another gym. Sweet. So I try to hit up this homie, Neil. <laughs> nothing. Nothing. All right? And literally, I remember telling Reich, I'm like, if this dude doesn't pick up now, that's it. Like, that was, because I was just like, because it was one of those things where I kind of thought to myself, I'm like, am I like small fish? Like, maybe <laughs> like he has like other clients. I'm like, I'm like, whatever, I'm gonna try him one more time. And he picked up, right? So came through, started trading. And it's so wild to think, you know, not, like now we're really tight and everything that like this could have easily not happened. And obviously as we started to know each other, I realized that you were busy moving into the space. To, so Sugar's giving you part A of the story. Part A. part A, part A. So Sugar's telling all his friends at the wedding that I just come across meet. Obviously he's got, Friends outside of the gym, surprisingly. <laughs> <laughs> but telling his friends this story and everyone's like, who is this guy? Like, why didn't he pick up for sugar? Now he's at, at the wedding. At that time, quite incredible. I was moving the gym, obviously. It was, I was setting up. So sugar's been part of the story literally from day one, from moving the mats in. I remember him coming after that call to the gym and I was like, bro, do you see why I didn't answer that call? And he was like, got you. Like, so not small fish, bro. You've been, yeah, two years deep. I've seen Trade. you grow. Bro. I've seen you grow. It's, it's been, I'm going to be, it's, it's been such a journey. And I think that's one of the things as I was saying about trying to train outside. Is that like, it's not that I don't know how to train. I've trained on my own, but it's more about the sense of accountability that it has. So like having you, like I can't bail. And I remember reading the policy. So you have to keep 24 hours, otherwise you cost that thing. So, and my training session is 5 a.m. So in the afternoon, if I'm not feeling it, I can't bail. Like you just sit, you just, you just buck up and get to the gym. And I, that's, that's, I think what's kept me consistent. And you're pretty good. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Pointing on that, you can tell a lot about a person's character just by commitment I've seen in the gym. So... Sugar, for the viewers, listeners, I think you've missed no more than five sessions in the last like two years. The sessions that you haven't come to, you've been traveling, speaking around the world, more important things than training, obviously. Like things that pay the bill so that you're able to actually come here. But as Sugar's seen my journey, it's been pretty cool to see how two years ago, we're like, bro, we're gonna start a YouTube channel. We're gonna start putting content out there. Two years, guys, two years. And Sugar was first to it. Some really cool things coming out on his creative side, which will obviously we'll get into the chat more with his career, what he actually does, how creative it is and how inspiring it actually is. But a really cool journey. And that's why episode two, I had to have him on. Really cool. But getting into it. Bro, what do you do? I obviously gave you the intro, gave the intro. What do I do? What do I do? I'm pausing there just to think a little bit because it's easier to just say, I make video games. That used to always be my calling card. Like, you know, when, you, when it was early days in my career, you're out in the club, <laughs> you know, someone's like, so what do you do? I make video games. 
and it always lights back. Well, it's like, always like, wow, wow. <laughs> you make video games. All right. You see that little twinkle in their eye, right? And some of the questions you get is like, people make video games in South Africa? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But then the question I've started to like dread every time I say that is that, do you work in any games I know? Because everyone will just instantly go to like FIFA, Call of Duty. And then I have to like go into the nuance of like what independent games are, small budget, you know. But in essence, I make video games. I make video games. So Sugar is saying small budget. Can you just pitch? Because when I heard and same question, so what video games, bro? <laughs> I was in, I say this and Sugar shot me down in the beginning, but I didn't play games growing up. And he's like, you didn't play Tetris. You didn't play Monopoly. You didn't play games. What do you mean? So compare like the budgets of so-called massive huge games, the GTA 6s versus small games. Not budgets going into numbers, but you work with a large team. Yeah, I have worked I think, over the years. I think the best, the easiest way without going into like the nitty gritty, you know, everyone at home can probably do the maths there. But GTA is made by like hundreds of people, right? Hundreds of people spread all over the world, right? And these games take years to make, right? But the indie game scene is something that's smaller. So like you're talking about like a handful of people, like five people. And my first game, professional game with Ben was basically two of us full time and then a few other people. Right? So maybe the whole team was five in general. So think about five people making a video game and like hundreds of people making a video game. They're significantly different. And so what you can achieve in that small team is nowhere close to what those big teams can do. But what I feel makes it different is there's a lot of heart because every single person involved in a small independent game, it's there for the passion. It's not just the job. But when you're working on these really big titles, like I'm a programmer by trade, you might be programming, let's say, the door that swings open for like two years. It has to be precise to the T. But when you're in a smaller uh, independent studio, you get to work on every part of it. Like I was pitching the game to investors all the way to like fixing bugs on day one. So it's been really cool. Which is pretty cool. You obviously said there that you're a programmer by trade. Walk us through because when you first told me when I was asked you, what do you do? I'm a game developer. And I was like, got that sparkle. What does it take to actually get to that point? Obviously your passion, your love for it, but your background, do you need a formal education? How does yeah. one get into the industry? There's so many routes into this industry. I think there's no exact route. Like, I mean, obviously there's always the conventional wisdom of go to university. Like if you want to be a programmer, study computer science and then find a job as a programmer. But I think with, the world that it is now with things like YouTube and things like Fortnite or Roblox, you can start making games like right now. You can go on the internet, type some stuff and be like, how to make a video game. You can find tools that don't need programming. You can find tools that are in Fortnite because actually you can make games in Fortnite. So I like to think that the entry into being a professional game developer is just the same way as becoming like a filmmaker, right? You have a phone in your pocket and you can film. It's almost as easy as making video games. In fact, interesting story. There's a game that just came out like a couple months ago. This is a kid, one person, had been making games on Roblox for a while and then just dropped this co-op multiplayer game and he's still a kid. It's estimated net revenue is like 37 mil dollars right so it's like this idea of like you got to go to university you got to go work here you can just sit in your bedroom instead of watching youtube on just entertainment just start tinkling away and obviously with a lot of these like distribution platforms like steep roblox i keep saying roblox or fortnite you can put your game out to the world like this and that's i think the beauty about just creative industries right now it's these the barrier to entry has become so low 
that it's actually scaring the pro game developers. They're just like, what have I been doing? <laughs> but saying that, it's quite insane. And we've obviously got into deeper conversations, 5 a.m. in the morning while squatting, deadlifting. But so now you've got the formal education, you've built games, you've worked with teams, you've built the network, spoken, and now listening to the story of this youngster building the game, hindsight, like I listen to you in the mornings and yeah. it feels like you're just getting started. Yep. There's always something new on the horizon. What have you learned from hindsight that is now shifting the gear, changing the path or pushing that envelope? I think the biggest thing I've learned, and I mean, even like getting into games, we should talk about that, is that the only thing stopping you, okay, obviously there's equipment, etc., internet access, but like barring all the like, you know, equipment, the only thing stopping you is you. Like that's what I've learned. Like you want to achieve anything these days, you can do it. Right. And that's what I think I've learned. And it's like, it's unshackled me from that sense of, you know, when I was growing up, I was always looking for the person to teach me how to make video games. But what ended up happening was, how do you make video game in Google? It sounds so ridiculous, but it's just that. That's the thing I've learned. Like anything you want to try to do, you can just, just type it in and just go on a journey. I like to think about all these like learning experiences more of like, it's just, you're going hiking, you're traveling. You might not have the exact roadmap, but you're gonna get there. You might make a few mistakes here and there, make take some detours, learn something you didn't think you wanted to learn, but now you do. And that I think just continuously builds onto your knowledge base and you can cobble together like a unique set of skills that someone else just doesn't have because you just didn't go the traditional route. So I think to me, it's the thing I think about in hindsight is no one's stopping you. Just, just figure it out. That can be said for any industry. The way the going out there, getting it done. So obviously, my industry, I've had to go do the formal education to be legally able to practice. But that whole mindset, it's almost leaning towards, and we've spoken about it, the resources we have available. The resources to, now you've got a teenage kid going and obviously going to go and net all of that or just build the game and put it out there. The resources now versus the resources when you started building the game, how has that changed just in the last five, five years? Exponentially, exponentially. Like you, you, that's the, that's the, the beauty. Like right now, like I was seeing, reading a stat is that kids these days search more on TikTok than they do on Google for stuff. I do that a lot. Like, it's just like interesting ways to find information. You can have bite-sized information and it's just the volume of resources out there. It's just, it's unparalleled. And especially free, like there's also just free information. Everywhere. I've been reading or oh, I read a stat earlier today. On average, people spend about six to seven hours behind their screen. So, just that alone, the amount of screen time, what's, what's your screen time building the game? Obviously, you behind that screen, coding, putting everything together. What's your sugar's average? Jeez, I don't even know. Like, huh. I don't know. I don't, I don't, that's the thing. I don't, like, I don't like to track my screen time just because it's scary. But if I was to hazard a guess, it would be, I think six to eight hours still sounds about right. Or twelve. Let's put it. At, let's put it. At, no, that's not. That's no, like, no, that's no, no. Peak, I'm, I'm just asking. When just... I think about it, it's maybe, maybe <laughs> let's just put it at eight hours. Okay, Got eight it. hours. A big part of this podcast is obviously speaking to professionals in the field and yeah. that have credentials. And in South Africa, you're one of the. You almost pioneered, you can say, the gaming, the development, launching that game on. On Wii, Nintendo. on Nintendo, sorry, yeah. Nintendo. Now, the gaming industry in South Africa, I know a few of your colleagues or networks come from abroad, they work in Cape Town, a lot of people do that. How do you... I read another thing, obviously, we're leading up to just kind of getting a better understanding. The amount of 
money in the gaming industry. It's in the billions, actually, well, I think even trillions. The South African market, how do you see that going? So, I mean, too I, much I of a broad question. I don't, I don't have, no, I don't think, it's not too much of a broad question. I think to me, it's more like, I don't have like the hard numbers for that. Yes. But what I will say is that the South African gaming market for people who buy it is nowhere near as close to, you know, the US or Europe or even like Asia. So what we like to do, and I think a lot of, you know, independent studios in South Africa do is that you leverage the lower cost of living here to make games for the international audience, right? And I think that's where our sort of superpower can lie is that we've got like skills, we've got games that have sold in the millions down in Cape Town, all over the, the country, games that have beaten Minecraft at award shows. Like we have the skills here, but we have also a lower cost of living, meaning that we can make the same games uh, as our counterparts in the US, but cheaper, meaning that we can have higher profit margins. High profit margins means that you can get to spend more money on making games. And that I think is the way I like to think about the South African market is that games for the most part are international. You don't need to print discs anymore. You put it online, someone can download. So you're never even actually even thinking about the South African market. You're just thinking about games. Games, right? Completely. And, and when you think about South Africa, what you're only thinking about is what's the resource pool look, look like? What are schools putting out? And how do we keep growing the industry to a point where government takes us seriously? I think that's <laughs> probably probably one of the biggest things to think about. Because like if you think about the film industry, the film industry is far more established. It's been here for a lot of years. I mean, a lot of big studios come and film in Cape Town, et cetera. So if games can slowly pick up steam and be in that position where you have funding from the DTI, et cetera, et cetera, you know, we can accelerate the growth to a point where you know, when you think about the South African market, it's more about the development market than just people buying stuff. No, that makes complete sense. Like, answers my question there. To well, speaking on the on gaming, I want to dive more into, obviously, what interests me a lot is the mentality of an individual. So you're saying spending 8 to 12 hours, peaking 12 hours a day behind the screen, still being able to wake up, 4 a.m. to come here to 5 a.m. session. That shows grit, tenacity. You're waking up, you get in here. It's not easy to wake up, obviously, at that time and come get it done. What keeps you ticking? I know a very deep question, but obviously the passion building games, what's that driving force, that discipline that you waking up and you come in and getting it done? It's my dream. <laughs> it's like, it's simple. Like, it's just that simple. I always think about it. It's just that it's what I want to do. Right. And I, I just want it. Like, I, I don't want to sit back. Like one of my biggest fears is just like complacency and just accepting. Like, I, I just can't sit in that place. Like, yeah, it's just, it's just the way it is. Right. Like, it just kind of sucks. Like, I hate that feeling. Or I hate, like, stagnating and not growing. So I'm always pushing to be in an uncomfortable place. And I think the what keeps me ticking is me thinking that I was born in Kenya, right? That's not a gaming industry. When I was growing up, games were being made, like, in Japan or the U.S. This is, this is literally on the opposite sides of the world, right? And to think that now, at this point, I've traveled and spoken at San Francisco, all over Europe, pitched games internationally, it, it got to a point where it's like, you just put in the work and you get it, right? Like that's, to me, it's like, it, it's like I can always show the receipt. It's like, you put in work, it comes out. And so to me, that's where the determination comes in. And especially when we were working on semblance, it was not a stereotypical job. You had, I had more freedom over my time. And I, those are just the small little things that just keep me going is that if you want it, you can go out and get it, but it's going to be hard. Right. No, I think that's awesome. That's why I asked. It's infectious. So 5am we hit the session and after every session, I'm like, 
Neil, you need to be doing more, bro. Like you, <laughs> you need to be pushing, you need to be pushing that envelope, which that's what drives me, honestly speaking. Listening to this, this mindset and just going forward, pushing yourself to the next level, so to say, breaking through that wall constantly. What trials would you say you were two youngsters, you and your best friend building a game, you're pitching to international companies. What are things that so-called humbled you that almost made you take a step back and just, so now you're in this mindset of just push, 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 but every individual goes through that, whoa, like this is a hurdle to climb. What standout stories do you have? Because I think, so during the time we were making Semblant, my life was Instagram perfect. <laughs> let, let me just put it that way. Like you go on the gram, sugar's here, I'm traveling here, I'm speaking there, he's making his game, he scored some fun day, I'm flying high. But what you don't see on the post is like the grind that you go through, how it's painful, how it's like sucks. There was a point where we literally didn't have any money to fly back to South Africa. <laughs> but like on the gram, it's just like, what's up? <laughs> me and me, me and my men Ben are like, how the how the fuck are we? We actually back didn't back to this. We need to figure. We need to literally score a deal to get back home. <laughs> like that's the plan. Like that's the, that's it. It's <laughs> like <laughs> otherwise, <laughs> you know, like straight hits the fan. But even that was still like a lot of fun. But I think the most humbling thing is that. When Semblance came out, Semblance came out. It was like a it was a critical success. You know raving reviews, all these sort of things, but the games industry is so hit driven and quite honestly speaking, it didn't hit the financial numbers that we needed uh, to continue being sustainable. Um, so at the time when that happens, all the flashy lights kind of disappear, right? And it's just, you're sitting there, everyone's coming up to you, it's like, well, congrats, you've done this. I'm like, shit. I'm being, I'm being supported by my partner. I'm like, dad, yo, can you, can you swing me some funds there? You know what I'm saying? That is humbling. And I think at that point, it was a very low point. It made me actually rethink a lot of how I approach life. What's the goal? What's the, you know, kind of perspective to go about things. I almost left the games industry because of that. And I think those are the kind of humbling moments that the thing I got out of that is don't get caught up in the hype. Like that's like some of the things that I think about a lot is like every time some shit is popping off and things like that, I'm like, don't get caught up in the hype, man. Like, you know, like there's this new opportunity I have and like everyone's like, oh my God, this is so cool. You're going to be here. You're going to be here. I'm like, yeah, but like, don't get caught up in the hype. Like just, you know, like you can get it all up in your head. You can think you're cool shit. And then you get smacked down again. So I think that's the one thing I learned about. I want to say it again. Don't get caught up in that. No, hype. I back it up. <laughs> I completely back it up. Right? It's, it's just, that was a thing that, that made me think about like, yeah, stay humble. Not that I wasn't humble, but it's just that thing of, it's not always pretty. And I just always want to stay very grounded in what I'm doing it for. Like I'm not doing it for the likes. I'm not doing it. I, I want to be sustainable and I want to just make games until I die. Like if I'm doing this on my deathbed, I'll be happy. I think that can be said, like what you just said there now resonates because building the gym, obviously get into a client base where a few years ago, this is everything I wanted. But someone said to me, and it was a very pertinent statement, it's either time or money. You have to pick it. Are you going to, chase the money or you're going to chase the time and I got to a point where everything was ticking the boxes what I wanted and I started dropping short on certain things in my life friendships family time going out my own personal time I own a gym but I wasn't even training I was just when's the next client when's the next client pushing those hours 14 16 hour days where people were like wow Neil this gym's sick this is cool but I was going home almost, what am I doing? Like w that purpose that started off where I wanted to build the gym and, you know, 
train the clients, the Olympic athletes, all these, just everyone. And I love doing it. I started losing a little bit about like myself. You hit in 16 hour days. I need to get that sleep. Go home, eat the meal, literally put my head on the pillow, fall asleep and not actually reflect and almost just get so entrenched in the business that you have no time to anything else. Yep. And yeah. getting caught up in the hop, you people come to you and say, wow, this is awesome. This is cool. But there's some days where you're just very lonely. Exactly. And exactly. I really like what you just said. It's like, it's time or money. And I was telling my partner, like the other day, I was like, the most valuable thing to me right now is my time. Like that to me, it's like, there's, no, like, there's nothing else. Like you, you can literally make more money, but you can't get back more time. And, you know, unfortunately, like the past few years, a few of my like friends have passed on and it really hits you in terms of like when I like when you've made it, when you you have all this cash and there's no one around you, like what's what's the point? And that was some of the stuff that I learned after shipping semblance is that I'd gone so hard, so into this thing. You come on on the other end and you're like, wait, hold up. All these other homies that were there. They're in the club with you. You're going out like, where's he where now? Are like, where are they now? Like, what's happening? And that's like, it just hit me hard. Those things like hit you hard. And now that's why I keep saying about being sustainable is that, but at work, I'm going to put in the graph, right? And I might even, I might redline it, right? But some of the stuff I learned also through that semester is that, you know, it's even the same in training. Like you can redline it for so long and then you can burn out. And then you actually just, on a net overall, it's just costly. It just does it's just, it's just like, everyone's like diminishing returns. The, you're yeah. gunning it, you're gunning it, you're gunning it, and then you're fucking dead for like a week. <laughs> like, it's not a win. Oh, and then you're sitting there, has them burnt out. Yeah, dude. It's like, <laughs> like, just take a chill. <laughs> so like, I've learned a lot about just like, I'll red light it, but then there's some days where I'm just like, just chill. Bro, please, you have to, because the one morning, I was probably in these burnout phases. Well, a few more names to be, to be fair. And you're explaining to me something called crunch in the gaming industry. And while you're explaining it, you know, when you hit that, like, <laughs> like, that and, love, and you're like, like oh, inside, you're like, I am going through crunch right now. Like, please, can you just for like yeah. pitch crunch for us? Then? Yeah. Like, so in the game industry, there's like, we're notorious for crunch. And I'll, I'll, first, I want to give a backstory about making video games. Making video games are the most complex things on the planet. Maybe rockets are more complex. <laughs> but I, I'd even argue that they're not. Because <laughs> like a game is all art forms coming together and then made interactive. Like It's like you make a film, you write a script, you go shoot it, the actors go home. You know, the cinematographers go home, then the editors come in and they do their thing and then you ship a thing. With games, someone has an idea. I want to make this, 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 and this. You get musicians, you start making the game and it's also software, so these bugs, like, it's just the whole this thing and you're like, oh yeah, it's going to take us a year to do this, right? And these, most of the people who make those projections, producers like me at the moment, right? They're <laughs> like, this is going to take us like a year and a half but those are always best case scenarios. You don't know, something goes wrong, you, you, you start making the game, you're like, actually, this is not fun, so you have to step back. And so these deadlines are never real. And so like with a lot of these big studios like EA, they have to make certain deadlines. Like there's just like, there's nothing moving after that. So the homies just crunch, they just work. Like they work, there's actually this really famous letter of a, of uh, someone's spouse from EA just talking about, I don't see my husband. <laughs> I don't know where he lives. Like, is he <laughs> cheating on me? <laughs> no, he's just working on the video game. And what's really toxic about it is that it's video games, right? I told you about the sparkle and the eyes. Like, oh my God, it's so cool. <laughs> yeah. So like the people who are working are thinking the same thing. Exactly. They're, the same thing. They're like, yeah, man, it's going to be so cool. You know, whatever. And then you just overcook it. <laughs> I heard that there was this story of a guy who was, he was crunching <laughs> and he As told you go buy diapers for the baby. Goes into the store and he realizes, what size must I get the diapers for? He hasn't seen his kid in so long. 
and it just breaks down Christ. So like that <laughs> mentality is it's really toxic. And like and a lot of the times the way they want to remedy this is I think it's a lot about better management. But it's always tricky. It's very tricky, this like industry that is like constantly going. Like even with software, you can put out like the software and then just kind of make it better as you go, right? But with games, if it comes out, your players hate it. So now you've spent jump. all those years <laughs> coding <sighs> yeah. to ship it and they're like, and nah. It's, it's, it's quite a, quite an industry. Cutthroat, so to say, like. Yeah, yeah. And it doesn't need to be. Talking about There's kids making games 37 <laughs> mil, like, like we're doing something <laughs> wrong, right? <like, laughs> you got the team, the crew, and just a little bit backstory with that kid. The process behind it, do you know how many months he could have taken to make it? Because now with obviously AI, chat GBT, coding, mm. walk us through a little bit how much how that has changed with the gaming, the development from a coding or creative. It's a, it's, a, it's a very touchy topic. It's a very touchy topic. I don't mind going. Shoot, shoot, shoot. It's a very touchy <laughs> topic, right? So especially with a lot of these uh, like mid-journey, all these art-related ones where you, you just type in some stuff and you got pretty pictures. Oh, my goodness. You don't want to do that on, on the games industry. You'll get slaughtered <laughs> like, in, like in the internet. <laughs> like, um, so it's, it's, a, it's a very dicey place because obviously when you have whole departments that can be replaced now. There's a very uh, significant part of video games called concept art. So, you know, you get the guy who comes in and have this idea. It's meant to be a guy in space with a gun and there's gonna be like this blue mood. And then they give it to someone and the guy paints it out, right? Now, and that takes days, maybe weeks to put out this like vision together. That same guy with the idea can it's out so that's very concerning and a lot of this stuff is so that's not really it's not really coming to fruition but we know that some of those big companies are looking into it because they're publicly traded companies they need to make that line go up every day right they need to show profit the shareholders don't care <laughs> if you can time it in just time it in just to like, get someone who can fix it and oh uh, they want to see that that line grow <laughs> exactly it's, so that's I think for a lot of people, it is, especially in the art uh, concept, right? It's, it's a bit, if I was there, I'd be scared. I don't know how to, you navigate that situation. I can't talk on anyone's behalf, but that's a tricky place to navigate. For programmers like me, I'm like, oh my goodness, I've got an intern that I don't have to pay, basically. Hey, ChatGPT, how do you write this code? And I think for me, when I use AI, especially for programming, it's not the greatest, but because I have a programming background, I can really leverage it to speed up what I'm doing. So I'm like, I'm like, oh, that's kind of wrong. I'll fix it. I can talk to it. And I always just think of it as like a dumb assistant, right? Dumb but smart, if you get what I mean, right? So AI, we're going to have to wait and see. It's getting wild out there. Tell me, obviously, you got the naysayers, AI, and saying you know what, AI is just going to take over, but they almost like sleeping on it. Should you be sleeping on AI? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, should you be sleeping on it? I think you know my answer. Like, you shouldn't be sleeping on it. Because I think the thing is, I've been trying to like see what you can do. Like, you push the boundaries. Like, oh, yeah, I'm going on holiday. Give me some tips. Way better than scrolling through 100 links on Google, stuff like that. At least you can get a starting point of like, let's say a holiday. And I think as we go into the future, it's just going to become natural. Like, it's just natural. I use it to, like, draft emails. Because I don't like writing. That's not really a good, that's not a strong suit for me. But now, I'll, like, write something, like, kind of shitty. And I'm like, hey, fix it. <laughs> you know, it's, again, my little dumb assistant, it's right? It's like, <laughs> hey, man, can you, can you make this sound a little bit profesh? It's like, you know, that's too profesh. That's too profesh. <laughs> Throw in a little emoji there. It's like, oh, yeah, that's good. That's good. Let's drop that in. You're right? And I think that, like, that to me is always like it breaks that, that first step, that like writer's block, right? Like I don't think it can get me all the way from zero to a hundred, but it can get me the first twenty, thirty percent. Then you start moving. Get that's how I look at. It. That's how. I, that's how I look at AI and trying to help you with stuff. 
And if you're not using it, you're to be dumb. honest, when I jumped onto AI, even so in my I industry, say dumb. Like that's no, no. You're good. Honestly speaking, I don't. My industry, it's in person. You're training the client, but just the way it's changed my business, the way I approach programming. Honestly, that assistance is right there. It's yeah. every industry. I feel as if it's just going to end. Like yeah, get in. I want to touch on a really cool thing you did last year, mm -hmm. which pushed you to crunch. Okay. 12 in 12. Oh, that was in last year. Yeah, so actually, sorry. So 12 in 12, I did in 2021. Okay. All right. And so 20, uh, 12 in 12 is, I got together a group of friends and we decided we wanted to get better at prototyping, making small little versions of a game. And so we told ourselves we'll make 12 games in 12 months. And that process, it sounds like I'm like overhyping it, but it fundamentally changed my life. And I'll tell you why, right? Because saying when you say 12 games in 12 months, it sounds absurd. Like it just sounds absurd. It's like, what are you doing? These things take years. What's the thing? But just pushing myself to like, all right, cool. I need to come up with a new idea. I need to flesh it out. One that it told me was that, the tools out there, talk about AI, talk about all these tools these days. They're so good, you can get things up and running. It made it be like, oh, I have all these ideas. I've had some of those ideas that I worked on, I've had for years. Just sat one weekend and did it. And it's just that repetition over and over again. And you get to the end of the year, you're like, oh, damn, I did it. It changed this sense of procrastination in me and also just the idea that you can just again you can just go do it and like there's nothing really stopping you and like it made me go over this perfectionism because you just at the the rule was like at the end of the month that's it you move on to the next thing so you're never like holding on to too many things and now why you're probably thinking about like la it was last year because last year I decided let me make a tiktok series out of it right and we were saying, right? Fire, right? Fire. We, were, we were talking Sugar about beat like, me try, to it. trying to jump into the content game. So I was like, I've been trying, I've been trying. So I was like, okay, cool. I'm going to make 12 TikToks about, about it. As of now, those 12 TikToks have, already, have over a million views collectively. And like, again, it's, it's like the project that kept on giving. And I think I've gotten job offers because of it. Like, it, there's... I've worked for these German companies on the side and things like that. And it's this idea again of like, the only thing stopping you is you. Like you just, you put it out there, you keep moving. And I think that's what the beauty of the way the world works these days is that, man, like all of that stuff is just like literally at your fingertips, right? And, and that's what it, to me, it just changes. Like these things are just really, it's possible. You just put yourself in put yourself in these situations and you keep going. But that, what I love what you said about that is, and a lot of people kind of miss it. I missed it for quite some time. We all have great ideas. We have great things that we can do. We speak to our buddies, pitch that business, talk about it. But the magic is in execution. In actually saying to yourself, you know what? I might blow up. I might not get any views. I might be ridiculed. But putting something together and executing, completely different to talking about it. 100%. I spoke to you, yo, bro, I'm going to do a podcast for how many months? Or I'm going to shoot that video for how many months? I shot my first podcast actually with my brother on his, his channel. And I listened to myself, like, like, <laughs> yeah, like, like. <laughs> and I, I looked at it and even though I'm putting the video out for to grow an audience in the long term and long run. Just talking, I realized something that I need to better myself. I'm gonna better myself through speaking to different people, through speaking some more over the mic, behind the camera, because I might be saying to you when I'm training, like five reps, like, yo bro, we're gonna squat, like, it's just executing like, that trick. It's man a dictionary. <laughs> right. It's like, it's, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> do you see what I'm saying? I know, exa I, I know exactly. Executing, what you're just... putting it out there, and you've seen so much. Yeah. And, and I, it's I, not I even it's, monetary. It's yeah, just... it's, that's the thing what's really interesting is that you just also don't know what it, these, are, these like 
experiences will lead you, right? You know if you keep doing the same thing, where you're going to go, but these new uh, putting yourself in uncomfortable situations, it just changes the way you think. And I think it's just like training, like a muscle, right? The more and more you put yourself in these uncomfortable situations, you're going to grow. And it becomes easier and easier and easier. It's like the gym. It's honestly speaking, Putting in those reps. You see, and that's getting caught up in the half again. You see all these podcasts coming out and crisp, the sayings, the reels. That's easy, man. Then you do it and you like, yo, whoa, okay. Okay, a little bit of tumbling. It's humbling. It's humbling. It's, I'm going to be honest with you. You listen to the speaker and you're like, bruh, what's the next question? How do I respond? That's, yeah. It's honestly it's so wild, which is so cool about it. It's, yeah, and I think what I love, one of, my, one of my favorite features like in YouTube is when you can go to all the person's videos and you search by oldest. And you click the old ones. That's called motivation. <laughs> get, get all these like motivational videos. Just go to some of your favorite You just go to the oldest. You'd be like, yo. Homie came from far. <laughs> but like, like you only look at his stuff like now, but like back then you're like, what? Ooh, webcam. <laughs> webcam. <laughs> like, and then you're sitting there be like, no, I need to get this like the DSLR camera and the road mic. I cannot start. You know, I got to get that nice bokeh in the background. Go to oldest and just start. Which we talk about him a lot, but Mr. Beast, how he's popping off. The dude counted to what number? I can't even off the top of my head. He said Logan Paul's name for like 24 God, hours. Like... Now he's busy paying people millions to just sit in a room. Like, like DC. You had to start <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> exactly. You, it, you just have to start. Which I completely, same goes with training, which is cool as why I had you on the guest. A lot of inspiration is probably kids, like I say, I see GTA 6, I've played FIFA, I've Tetris, I probably play every single day just before I go to bed. And it's entrenched in our lives. Games, the way we think, we think in riddles, in games. And just listening to a story, the Nairobi Kenyan boy going and studying these computer science, programming, building these games, and at your age still getting started, the teenagers, it's inspiring. It's inspiring. Yeah. Yeah, I think like it's this thing where, you know, you asked me like, how do you get into the games industry? And I think a lot about just how I got into the games industry. I got my first console in for like my seventh birthday. It was a PlayStation. I remember putting it on. PlayStation one, two. PlayStation, the OG one. No. The OG one, the one you go, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Put that thing on. It was like magic on the TV. I look up to my mom. I'm like, so people do this as a job? She's like, yes, that's what I'm going to do. This is when I'm seven years old. I didn't know where to go. There was no internet that back then, you know? So I didn't know <laughs> what to do. So it was just a dream. I'm there in Kenya. Games are being made in America, Japan. I'm like, it'll come to me somehow. <laughs> I don't know. Someone will, someone from, someone will bestow this <laughs> knowledge on Just me. drop right in front right. of you. So I go to you. So, so this is like high school. I meet a friend of mine. He's also like, I want to make video games. I want to make video games. I'm like, cool. What do you got to do? What you do? It's like, I heard you've got to learn how to program. I'm like, program? What's this? It's like, it's teaching computers to do what you want it to do. Chachi me too. So I'm like, okay, cool. I got like, I got one little nugget. I'm like, program. That's all I got to do. At the same time, my parents were like, you're going to boarding school in South Africa. I'm like, but why? <laughs> and then I'm looking at the course. There's this thing called IT. You learn how to program. I'm like, bang, that's it. We're making video games. Mom, I'm out. Peace. Get to my first class. Teacher gets onto the whiteboard. She starts writing public, static, void, main. I'm like, how about? What's this? <laughs> She's like, you've got to know all of this by heart. By heart? There's not even a sentence on the board. Like, what am I with just arbitrary random letters? But I'm like, nah, I got to learn how to make video games. Hands down. Go through high school, finish high school, get a distinction in programming. I was actually failing programming. And I was like, they even sat me down and they were like, sugar, you know, um, this uh, programming thing, maybe you want to reassess. I'm like, nah, 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 nah. Video games. I'm making video games. But trick, got through it, got distinction, get into vids, right? So now I'm 18. 
at this point, I've been waiting to make video games for 10 years. I'm like, I know how to code. Where's the video game? Come at me. Vits, first year, second year, third year comes around. You know, I'm just about to turn 21. I've already turned 21. I look to my other mate. Now he also wants to make video games. I'm like, bro, we're not making video games, all right? We're literally not making... If we graduate, we're going to go make ATM software. And I didn't go through this pain of doing this. And that's when I went to Google and typed, how do you make a video game? And to this day, I sit there and think, I've had the internet since I was 16. Why didn't it ever occur to me to just type it into the Google and say, how do you make video games and just start? That's what I was saying. The only thing stopping you is you. And like, I sometimes think about it a lot and it's because there's a lot of stuff like in conventional wisdom is that you've got to find the person to tell you how to do the thing, right? You got to go to school, you got to do this thing, you got to find that course, you got to get that camera. But it's just right there in front of you and you can just go out and do that. So that's why I always like to say, like, I went through, I knew I always wanted to make video games, but because of the way society is just like built, maybe I'm blaming them, but like, it just always is like, oh, I need to find that person. But like now you shouldn't just start. <laughs> that has a lot of merit, honestly speaking. I remember in matric, grade 11 matric, all the homies, friends, Neil's probably going to be a personal trainer. And I was like, yeah, I am. That's actually, my mom had other plans. Become law, accounting. I said to my mom, personal trainer, it is. You're something safe, yo. <laughs> <laughs> These get muscles a, are not going to get you anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> get a real job, they said. Get a real job. <laughs> so I'm looking at, it was Ronnie Coleman, lightweight. <laughs> We're looking at the OG, Gymshock, Jeff side. And I'm like, these guys are making millions. They, they Mom, YouTube. <laughs> That's my, my pitch. Look at the YouTube guys. Look at these guys on Muscle Mag. And anyways, I get into university and I start doing a, a personal training course. But I think it was a third year guy came up to me and he's like, dude, stop studying this. It's a dumb degree. You know, get a real job. Like you're not going to go. In. And I'm looking at him and I'm, I'm busted. I'm like, I pitched my mom, you know what? I want to be a personal trainer. <laughs> like, <laughs> this guy, you third year, you look at them like, he knows what he's doing. He's in third year, I'm yeah. in first year. Who am I to say otherwise? And conventional wisdom, stick it through, to be honest with you, the first few years of my career, a bit turbulent, had those get a real job going through my head. And you start looking things looking at things with a different perspective and start asking the right questions, start putting the correct prompts in chat GBT. When you ask those, the correct questions, you're going to get the correct answers or somewhat correct. And I got to a point where I wasn't even asking people in the industry. I was asking different businessmen, businesswomen, how did you get here? A big reason for the podcast, asking, listening to different journeys, asking the questions and that conventional wisdom didn't get me to where I am today. It was asking a multitude of resources. Yep. The program designer, the game developer, the businesswoman, as I said, doctor, yep. just a buddy. Yep. And yes, there is merit, as I said, to following that conventional, get a good degree, get a job. But what is a good degree? We've spoken about yep. AI now. Yeah, and I like to think about it as like, what do you want? Like, I think that's like, I always find myself really blessed, like in knowing that I, I knew what I wanted to do, like very early on, even, even when I wasn't sure if it was going to be in games, I knew I wanted to program. I loved that. And that's like something that I think a lot of people don't realize. If you just like, like, what do you actually want? Right. And it's, it's absurd that some kid in Africa is like, I want to make video games. Like, that's just an absurd thought. Like when I think about it, I'm like, what do you mean? Sugar, stay in your lane. <laughs> stay in your lane. Go get a BCom and get something like a real job. But I think I'm really like I'm really uh, glad I had the parents I had because my parents just told me, you can do whatever you want. Just make money. That was it. That was the only prompt that was given. That's the only prompt I was given. And so when I think when when folks are out there and they're trying to figure out like, oh, it's like, what do you want? Like, and everything's out there for you. 
but it's going to be hard. I'm not going to lie to you, right? You want to go run the comrades. You're going to need to train. It's going to be painful, right? You want to run a gym. You're going to start somewhere. Like it's, it's just this thing of you can make it happen, but you've got to be put, you got to be ready to put in the work. And I think a lot of people, you just see, oh yeah, it's NFT, my boy. It's <laughs> NFTs. We there. <laughs> you know? You're on it's that crypto, crypto chain. It's like, it's like, it's just this thing of, it, we were able, a lot of people are always looking for shortcuts. And what I've just come to realize, it's just the work, man. Just put in the work. And if, and if you want to, I believe, if you want to get somewhere where you're happy and successful, go do something you fucking love. Because when you start chasing just the cash, you're going to run out of steam. You're going to run out of steam. And, but if you're doing something you love, and that's why I say for me, it's like, I just want to make video games. And I need to figure out how to make money making video games. All right, you need to build the audience. You need to do this. You, you just reverse engineer the process and then put in the work, put in the hours. Completely. Find the network. Just like hustle. When a client comes to me, well, and I've adopted this strategy into every way in my life, set the goal, write it on the whiteboard, write at the top. What's my goal? What do I wish to achieve? What do I really actually want? Because what others want and what you think you want is different to what you want. It's what do you as a person want for yourself? What are you willing to do? What are you willing to sacrifice? A yeah. big thing. What are you willing to say? You know what? I'm no longer going to do that. I'm no longer going to be chilling with those people. I'm no longer going to be having those late nights. And setting that goal and reverse engineering it. Now, what are the steps I need to take to get to that point? Yep. You said building an audience, putting yourself out there. When I met Sugar... Yes, she had a profile online, a really solid one, Forbes 30 under 30, looked, obviously looked you up, I yeah. look at all my clients. And, but you never had the TikTok. But now you put out this TikTok, get over a million views, and now you got people from all over the world reaching out to you. Yeah. So a big thing, like you said, is set the goal. Hard work works yeah. at the end of the day. Simple. I remember my brother was creating my website when BSC started didn't know what I was doing, just said, bro, make it look cool. And all I want is hard work works because that's what I knew. Wake up early, set yourself the goal, show up, do the work, get it done. Yep. Yep. It's so fun. It's like, it's, 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 it's pretty simple. It's actually, it's, 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 it's pretty simple, but we like to overcomplicate. And I think that's the thing is that you are where you are in your life and you're busy just listening to you listening to myself. From the get-go, we just overcomplicated it. Make so much money, just get a real job, study all the degrees. Do this, do just this. listen a little bit more, put your head down, think what you really want, ask more questions, do more things. Yeah. I like, I read something, you, you wrote it right at the end, I'll pull it up, but just go out there, do a lot of things, get a lot of experience, just do more things, you're gonna learn more, you're gonna have fun. That's my biggest advice I would give to a younger person in the industry is just do more. Open yourself up to everything. Don't close any doors. Don't burn any bridges. Don't speak badly to people, honestly speaking. Just, if you don't agree with somebody, walk away, say cool, keep quiet, but put yourself out there, do the most, work hard and really work hard. Don't say you're working hard, but then you're chilling on your phone. Even if it's an hour of deep work a day, it doesn't need to be the 12 hour shift. It just needs to be intentional, hard work every single day, consistently compounded. Consistency. That's why red lighting it and burning out is not is silly. It's put so in that steady work. Steady work, exactly that. You know, just working out. It's cruise. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I just want to go back that like know what you want because comes back to that thing I was saying about getting caught in the hype is that you'll be chilling with the homies and then you you get this feeling of like oh yeah you, I need to drive like a, a Porsche I need to be doing this and you do that but like when I, I and that's the thing is like when I really dug deep I'm like what do I actually want like I don't really give a shit about Ferrari I don't really give a shit about a big mansion all I want to fucking do is make video games it's that simple I just want to make video games and I want to be chill like, I, like, and that's the thing is that you, you go onto TikTok and you're streaming, you're like, you're not doing enough. 
you're not doing enough. But what is enough? Like it's like just what, at, at least what do you know enough? that. At least know that benchmark. You know. So when your homie's like, you know, you gotta get into that NFT game, man. You know, it's gonna make us cash. And I'm like, do I want to sit down and spend time learning this NFT game, or do I want to keep focusing on making video games, whatever you want to do? It's a time thing. We're That's talking about time, right? Where do you want to put your time in? <laughs> uh, I want to back up on that. That is just be happy on a serious note. If it makes you happy driving that Ferrari, that Lambo, mm. respect, mm. complete, on a serious it. note, respect it. But ask yourself, is that what you want? Are you going to sacrifice A, B, C, D, E, F, G to push for something that you think you want? Or are you going to say to yourself, you know what, Neil, sit down. What do you want every day? What makes you happy? What brings you joy? What actually keeps you fulfilled? That cup's just going to carry on getting filled. Yeah. Making money is cool. Like, I'm we sure. You to make a, a certain amount of money, for but sure. But there's, if you want to go the long game, if you want to, if you want, I think if you want to go the long di game, the, the long distance, do what you fucking love. Because that, when things get dark, they'll get dark. <laughs> they'll get dark. You know, you don't want to be fucking sifting through NFTs. Oh, sorry, I'm hating on NFTs <laughs> yeah, a lot, right? Bashing. But I'm like, I'm just like, it's just a thing of. I think when I launched you about NFTs a few months ago. Yeah. I was like, yo, Sugar, you're in this kind of industry. Yeah. Like, what do you think about NFTs? And you looked at me and you're like, bro, why are you asking me this? Like, you disrespect to me. And I felt, <laughs> I was like, I'm sorry. I'm like, you know what? To me, like, actually, let's have a chat about that. Shoot. For me, it's like, I'm, I'm like, honestly, from a technical perspective, the blockchain is really interesting, right? I don't think we found the, the right use case. The NFT came out. I'm actually a bit bummed now that I didn't buy an NFT in the time. Like, <laughs> okay, you know, I'm let's... not even going to lie. I'm not even going to lie. I wish I just bought one. Not to like make money. Like I just wanted to be like, you see this thing? It's an <laughs> NFT. Right? No, it's like, no, that's photo roll. No, 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 no. It's not the photo roll. It's an NFT. But it looks like just a photo. I just, I, like I wanted that. But it, it just comes to the same thing about time for me. It was just like, okay. But like now I must go do research and then do like I just sometimes I just want to watch some Netflix and chill. I'm just look at the NFT. <laughs> the prices are going up. This guy made so much money. I'm like, why didn't you make money? <laughs> anyway. But no. I, yeah, I think it's just let's just do what you want to do. And question just to a finisher. What does Sugar see himself doing next? Back at chilling, making games, just, yeah. I, I think I just keep doing what I'm doing and just keep optimizing it to be like the sweet spot. And that's why I was saying like being very clear for me, it's like I've become very clear on like what my ideal lifestyle wants to be. And that's what I'm like, that's what I'm chasing, right? I, I, I've realized like certain things, like I don't want to run a big company gets caught up sometimes i get him caught up in the hype it feels cool you're like yeah man i got like 30 people under me and i'm managing it i'm so fucking stressed some people wear stress <laughs> like it's a badge of honor like yeah man i'm so fucking stressed i'm so busy yeah 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 you know and then they'll sit there and be like man i'm a unit but i'm also fucking so taking care of my body <laughs> taking care of my body but like you're so stressed you're like you're gonna get a heart attack at 35 so like to me it's just like i want to just be more chill, work with just chill people. I, I like the easy life. Because honestly, I've been getting these white hairs, Neil. Let me be honest <laughs> with you. And it's making me nervous. It's been making me nervous. I'm like, I'm only like 30 and I've got these random white hairs and shit. And I'm not like, it's, this is stress, 100%. stress. 100%. I want to just be like my, like one of my, like my grandfather. He's like 70. When we retired, like when he was like 40, just ch coasting, nothing much, I'm just chilling and smoking. I'm like, look at this guy, he's living long, man. <laughs> he's living long, he's not vegan, he's not anything. What is it, for me, the key thing is like that stress level. Like in this like modern age, like stress is just up here. You go on TikTok, you're not doing enough, but you're also not sleeping enough. <laughs> I don't know what you're meant to do. It's, it's <laughs> What I, where do I see myself doing next? It's just chill. Chill. Getting off that hamster wheel and just actually enjoying the fruits 
enjoying life, actually stopping instead of, I think it hit me. I was actually visiting. <laughs> it's quite a funny story. Visiting my girlfriend and in France last year. And we were on a Ferris wheel. And I had my, photo, my phone out recording the river. And I heard the couple behind me say, he's not even enjoying what he's doing. Oh, damn. I heard it. They never even said it in French. I was honestly sitting there. It was one of the, the back, it took me back to first year, bro, get a real job. Like you're wasting your time. And just listening to that. Yeah. It's get off the hamster wheel. Enjoy life for what it is on a serious note. Find what you love, do what you love. And just, yeah, have a good time. I hope Me. <laughs> Sugar, bro, I want to thank you. Thanks for coming on episode two. I don't see this being the last. This was a cool, cool podcast. I really think there's follow-ups. We'll what see how, said. Yeah, how the journey goes. We're year two. How rocks? We'll save that for another podcast. Yeah. How rocks prep. I'll lay how rocks for sugar. <laughs> <laughs> podcast definitely we'll hit another one i really enjoyed that and thank you super insightful story well super inspiring not insightful like your whole journey what you've been through where you've got and as a mate knowing you for this long i can see it's just the beginning and that's what excites me even more is that there's so many things in your way that you've now engineered in a way that it's going to look after yourself at the same time time sight. You're attacking things more mature, better, resilient. You have that whole tool bo toolbox of knowledge, skills, crushing it. 100%. Not crunching. Not crunching. Not crunching. Not Not crunching. Crunch. The only crunch I like is in my muesli. <laughs> That's it. Back it. Thanks, yeah. Legend, bro. Cheers. Sweet.